Good morning and welcome to worship in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Pastor Jim. I'm so glad you've chosen to join us on this first Sunday of Lent. We began Lent last Wednesday with our Ash Wednesday service. And Lent, as you probably know, continues for 40 days up until Easter Sunday. And it's a time of preparation. It's a time of examination. It's a time self-examination. It's a time of repentance and confession. All of those things go into this season of Lent. Um, and today we're beginning a series of messages called, the series is called Meeting Jesus at the Table. And it culminates in the communion table, of course, that we will celebrate next Sunday, on the second Sunday of Lent. But when you think about tables, Jesus meets us at all of our tables, whether it's the dinner table, the fellowship table downstairs, the table in the coffee shop, a table at school, a table at work, wherever you meet other people, that's the table where Jesus is present. And so we're going to talk about um, a different kind of table today in the first of these, these messages, and it's dining al fresco because Jesus uses the table of the earth to feed 5,000 people. So it's a different kind of table. It's outside. Um, but nevertheless, the same principles and same love, same fellowship is shared at that table. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the lessons in, the, in that passage that describes the feeding of the 5,000 al fresco. All right, so thank you for joining us today. Um, I believe we have an announcement from Crystal about an exciting event that just wrapped up yesterday. Crystal, Brian, and Tyler. Three for the price of one. Good morning. Uh, this weekend, our youth group participated in the 30-hour famine. Over the last 30 years, 6 million students have raised money and awareness to world hunger by fasting and participating in the 30-hour famine raising over $190 million to feed kids. This weekend we raised $520. You can see by our sign of the number of kids we fed for over there. Each finger parent equals one child. The 30-hour famine um, it's just such a blessing to see each year how God works through the time that we spend together. Um, each year is a little bit different, but it, and, and maybe it's just because we're fasting and we're spending time separated from the world and together in fellowship. Um, but this year we, got, we had the opportunity um, to spend time in worship on Friday evening at the Wren Collective concert, the Whosoever Tour, and it, it was truly an amazing night of worship. And um, over the years, you have heard the youth group sing during Vacation Bible School, My Lighthouse, and Rescuer. Those songs were played, and it, you know, they, it was a good event. So we are very thankful for that. And then Saturday, we actually um, were able to join the Mount Pleasant Presbyterian Church. They came with us to World Vision. There were over 150 people that were there on Saturday at World Vision helping to package, unpackage and repackage clothing to be sent to different countries around the world. So it was a good time. And the sign that Tyler was pointing to, it says one fingerprint, one dollar, one child fed for a day. So there are 520 fingerprints on there for the money that's been raised so far um, by our youth group for, for World Vision. Um, you still have the opportunity to donate if you'd like to. You can do that through the offering plate. Just put, a memo, put on the memo, World Vision or a 30-hour famine. You can also donate online. It's available on our uh, church Facebook page, the link to, to donate there too. So we hope to update all of you in a couple weeks with some of our pictures, a slideshow, and, and a total of the money that the youth group raised. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, so 
those numbers that Brian threw out are, are amazing numbers. Six million um, students have participated in 30 years. $190 million has been raised for world hunger. Um, so it's just an amazing effort um, led by this organization, World Vision, and the fact that our youth and adults participate is a testimony to uh, what we are called to do. We're called to serve others, those less fortunate than we are. Um, I have one other donation to talk about, and last week I mentioned that the Mars UP Church is collecting cleaning supplies for, to fill cleaning buckets for the folks in East Palestine, Ohio. So uh, whether it's money donations that you can put in our offering plate and mark it um, for East Palestine uh, effort or cleaning supplies to fill those buckets. We're going to ask you to place the cleaning supplies if you brought some today on that top of the food box over there in the corner, all right, where we normally collect food for the lighthouse. And uh, the Mars UP Church will probably be here tomorrow to pick up supplies and monetary donations. Uh, they want to deliver those, those supplies and the, um, the money to fill the, the buckets. Uh, they want to deliver everything to Ohio uh, this week. Okay, so I know it's a short, it was a short notice uh, for everybody, uh, but the need is right now. And, and the needs are going to change probably in two weeks. There will be other needs. Uh, but right now they have to clean their houses inside and out. They have to clean everything that's in the area inside and out. Um, so it's a big effort that's required and a lot of help is required. So um, I think that's all I have um, as announcements. Let's prepare hearts and minds for worship. Good morning. Please pray with me. All-knowing and all-caring God, we gather this day, drained by another week. We are like a parched desert, empty and in need of replenishment. Visit us with your presence, saturate us with your spirit, and bathe us in your streams of living water that our lives might acknowledge and worship you to the praise and honor of Jesus Christ. In his name, we open our worship 
and praise today with this prayer. Amen. Please, please stand together if you are able and join me in singing our opening hymn. seated. Christ calls us as his body to share his good news and his peace. Today, as we share the peace of Christ with one another, give these words to those around you. May the light of Christ shine in you always. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Trusting ourselves to the grace of God let us take a few moments to silently confess our sins before God. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Please pray with me. O Holy Spirit, through your word, bring us to our Savior. And in response, triune God, prompt our hearts to offer you sincere thanks for our salvation. In the strong name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray for open hearts and minds to understand your message. 
Amen. For the first reading from Psalm 32, verses 1 through 7. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, in whom, whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my inequity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Our New Testament reading today is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 6, verses 37 to 44. Hear God's word. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. May God bless our hearing of his word today. Amen. Boys and girls, it's time for a children's message. Come on up front. I appreciate that. Actually, preacher, will you say this word out loud for me? <laughs> Maskil. Thank you. Maskil. I just wanted to make sure pronunciations isn't my best point. So let me ask you an easy question. Do you know who David was? Go ahead. Uh, was that the person like the lion's den? The lion's den. That's Daniel. It starts with a D and an A, so you got two out of three. Okay, now it's, it's all up to you. All the coins, like we're staring at your parents right now. Wait, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me give you a smaller hint. Who was King David? That might make it a little bit easier. That tells you about his old age. Go ahead. It, it's okay, putting on the spot. It's not a fair tactic, but I like to use unfair tactics. Go ahead. Is it like David and Goliath? David and Goliath, that is absolutely how he, one of the things that helped him go on the journey that it took in the long lifetime 
to become a king. But once he became a king and chilled out and gone on with his life in his old age, he wrote a lot of poems. And this is a word I had never come across before. Do you see it? Have you ever seen that word? I've never. You? Oh, just now. Yeah. So, masculine. So I had to look it up because I didn't know what it was, but I assumed it had something to do with poetry because the book of Psalms is about poetry. It means enlightened or wise. Now, I marked, I love this Bible because I believe in having a relationship with the Bible much like you have a relationship with God. Now, when they tell me what I'm supposed to talk about, they give me a New Testament and an Old Testament. Old Testament, very difficult. First of all, because I always start with this thing called King James. That's where they talk in a language we don't use anymore. And I usually just, to get my old roots, I listen to it in King James. And then I do NLV, which is New Living Translation. There's all kinds of Bible translations. The preacher loves to use the Bible translation called the message. They all have a little bit of a different feel, a different relationship. So if you notice, do you see what I did right there on Psalm 32? Now, once again, this is Old Testament. So it's before Jesus came, and there's just not as much forgiveness before Jesus came. And there's a lot more rules. So I don't normally like to do the Old Testament. But lately, I've been kind of bored doing the same exact thing. We talk about food a ton in the Bible. We talk about fellowship a ton in the Bible. I can close my eyes and give you 14 messages on how important it is to eat together, how much fellowship happens, and how much fellowship is just represented by those awesome fingerprints that you created. It's not just the people on there, but it's the mouths that were fed. To me, that's kind of an easy message. Psalms, take some works. Tell me what I drew that you can see on this Bible. A bunch of smiley faces. A bunch of smiley faces. Do you see any faces that aren't smiley? And then one um, frowny face. One what? Frowny face. One frowny face and a bunch of smiley faces. So that's kind of how my brain works. It works in pictures. So as I was reading this in here, this is all the happy stuff. And there was one sad stuff. So Tyler, will you come beside me and let me make you uncomfortable for a moment? Okay, will you hold this in front of me? I really thought about how I was going to do this. So smiley face is all the nice stuff. Now I'm just gonna lean a little bit on you for this. So all the nice stuff, happiness and joy to you. You get to be forgiven, Woohoo! You know what? The Lord cleared you of everything there is. Mm. But sometimes, when I refuse to confess my sins, and my body feels like it's going to waste away, and the hand of discipline is heavy upon me. But then I remember, I can talk to God, and I can tell him what's wrong and going on. And he forgives me, and I am overjoyed. I am cleansed like great water. Thanks. I appreciate that. So to me, like when I read that, that's all about a relationship with God. Sometimes in those disciplined moments, you can feel him weighing on you. In the consequences in earth, in the conversations with others, you can feel him. But going to him and telling him all the stuff that you did wrong brings you up. And instead of that hand being heavy upon you, it is helping to hold you, excuse me, to hold you up. So to me, that's what Psalm 32 was all about is your guys's relationship and how you talk to God let's close our eyes and fold our hands dear Heavenly Father thank you so much for the blessings that we have for the relationship for the fellowship that this church provides not just for the people who are in the pews but all over the world who are touched by those little fingerprints. Thank you for the hearts and hands that get us there. And it is in your holy and blessed name we pray.
please be seated. Lent, the season of Lent, the idea of Lent, was originally established for brand new Christians, those who experienced a call from God to confess and to become part of his church. They were to spend 40 days and 40 nights preparing for their baptism. If at the end they still wanted to follow Jesus, then on Easter Eve, they would be baptized as the sun was rising on the east, signaling the new day, the new era, all inaugurated because of the resurrection. I am sure it had a powerful significance on all of those people in the early church to have prepared for their vocation as Christians the same way that Jesus prepared for his as the Messiah, 40 days of introspection and self-examination. But later, the church used the 40 days as a time of renewal for those who were already Christians. Because of a certain point, everyone in the empire had become a Christian. Everyone was baptized as infants. So the time of Lent was used as a time of renewal and recommitment to the Christian life and to Jesus Christ. And that's how we think about it today. Examining our lives in Lent in the light of the one that we are, have chosen to follow. This is how we view Lent, and for most of us, it is 40 days of recommitment to Christ. So, as I have said, I'm beginning this series of messages for Lent, which we will continue as we journey together toward Easter morning. This series is based on a little book resource that another pastor showed to me called Meeting Jesus at the Table. How appropriate is that? And it was written as a Lenten study this year, so it's brand new, 2023, and published this year. Today we want to focus on just one of the many ways that Jesus shared this table with a multitude of people that we read about in Mark 6. So meeting Jesus at the table is more than just coming to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It includes that but it's much more than that. Certainly, meeting Jesus at the communion table is important to every one of us as Christians, especially during this Lenten season. Today, as the first Sunday of Lent, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper next Sunday on March 5th. So join us for that, and we will meet the living Jesus Christ here during worship. This series of messages, though, is all about the stories throughout the New Testament where Jesus chooses to meet people for a meal. He eats at a lot of banquets. He goes to dinner parties. He eats with his friends outside. He eats with his friends and enemies inside. So I invite you to reflect with me during this Lenten season on how tables where we gather together to eat food, shape our identity as followers of Jesus Christ, because they do. It is my hope and the hope of the authors of this resource that these stories about tables and sharing will draw us closer to Christ and to each other as the body of Christ. Let's all try to recognize him in the breaking of bread and in the sharing of meals together, no matter where it happens. So our first table story does not include a table at all. I mentioned that. The table is the, is the outside, nature, right? It takes place at a huge picnic in the wilderness. And as we just read, this story begins like several others with Jesus, leading a large crowd of people up a hillside to teach, to preach, and to heal. He's already done those things by the time our passage occurs. 
This feeding of a multitude of people is told in all four Gospels. In fact, this story appears six times in all four Gospels because both Mark and Matthew repeat it. They mention it twice in a little different way. Therefore, it should tell us something that it's important. There's an important lessons. There are important lessons in this dining al fresco story. In all six versions of this in the Gospels, there are probably three main themes, at least. Wilderness, hunger, and bread. So we're going to talk about those three today. And so let's talk about the context of this story in, out in nature. In today's reading, Jesus, his disciples, and the crowds are all outside, right? In the wilderness. Now, wilderness is typically understood by us to mean a deserted place away from cities and towns. And that's exactly where it occurred. A place where creature comforts, even during Jesus' time, were scarce. They didn't bring picnic baskets with them. They didn't bring a bottle of wine or cheese or a blanket even with them. It points out to us that all of our needs, in all of our needs, we should rely on God. That's the first lesson. All the stories of the wilderness in the Old Testament describe this truth in di different ways. God provides for his people, always. This wilderness in today's reading also points to another truth, though. This crowd was a community of faith. They believed that Jesus, even though they didn't know who exactly he was, they believed that he was doing something special and worth their time to listen to him. They were willing to follow him to find out. They were curious. They were all drawn by what Jesus had said and already done. And so that's a, that's a very limited level of faith. They had faith they were going to discover something. They were seeking a deeper, larger life with God that Jesus had been talking about for a while now. And yet, at the end of the day, in our text, they were still hungry, physically hungry, both physically and spiritually, actually. And Jesus knew that, of course, and dining al fresco meant that there was no food close by. They couldn't go to their picnic basket. They couldn't go to the local convenience store. They were out in nature, in the wilderness. So secondly, let's talk about hunger a little bit. In America, we have a love affair with food. Let's be honest, right? That's a good way to describe it. It's not perfect, but it's a good way to describe it. It's a source of temptation, certainly. It's also a cause for celebration, certainly. We can't survive without it, certainly. And the Bible is full of food stories, right? Eve was tempted with an apple. Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of pea soup. Heaven will be like a wedding banquet, we're told in multiple places, prepared for a king. In our scripture today, Jesus feeds 5,000 people with five loads of bread and two fish. Two sardines is what the commentaries say. This compelling story is told in, told in all four gospels, has a couple of phrases that I want to point out on our way to Holy Communion next week. The first is a command. The command from Christ is given to the disciples who are concerned about this hungry crowd, as you heard, at supper time. The sun is going down, and they've been there all day. In verse 37, Jesus responds to them by saying, you give them something to eat. That's not a suggestion. It's a command. Of course, the disciples respond with, 
That would take eight months of a man's wages. How are we going to possibly afford to buy food enough to feed them? Are we to go and spend that much on this huge crowd of people and give it to them? This brings up a haunting question for us today. Are we to go and feed the hungry? That's the command for every one of us. Hunger is still a serious worldwide problem. You heard some of that um, when they talked about what our youth group did this weekend with the 30-hour famine. 24,000 people die from hunger every day. That's a recent statistic. That one, that one, that's one life every 3.6 seconds. 75% of them are children. 75%. Under age five, in fact. It's no coincidence that this weekend our youth have completed the 30-hour famine sponsored by World Vision to combat this world hunger challenge. They didn't know about my sermon series, right? And I didn't choose this sermon series because they were doing the famine. But God connected the two this weekend. According to the USDA, I looked up some further statistics. World Vision publishes a lot of statistics. And I found out that the U according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, 4.4 million households in the United States suffer from hunger. And that number is increasing, especially among the working poor. It's also no coincidence that our community food box at the edge of our parking lot out there has been used very consistently the, since the first day we put it up. Food insecurities are a worldwide problem and a local problem. It's in our backyards. Prevalent in the United States and right here. Jesus gives his disciples a, and us a compelling command. You give them something to eat. The second phrase in our passage this morning that I think is important is a comment that gives us the result of this table story. Verse 42 says this, they all ate and were satisfied. All 5,000 ate and were satisfied. Is there a hunger that food will not satisfy? I think that's an easy answer. Jesus, tempted in the wilderness to turn stones to bread, replies to Satan, and you probably remember what he said, man does not live by bread alone. We do not live by food alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, we never think, we rarely think about it like that. In America, perhaps the assumption in lots of us is that food will provide comfort, satisfaction, or acceptance that, that only God can give us. Our overeating lifestyle may not be about size, style, or even wealth. It may just be about idolatry. Right? That's, those are difficult words for me to say, but... Can food be made into an idol for us? I think that's an easy answer too. Very easily. Because it's so prevalent. It's so easily accessible to most of us. Satan will use that idol at every opportunity. Our third and final theme found in these dining al fresco table stories is bread. This was a simple meal of bread and fish. It didn't get much simpler back then. You and I know the simple meal of the Lord's Supper, right? Bread and cup, representing the body and blood of Christ. In this wilderness where Jesus commands the disciples to feed this crowd of 5,000 
simple loaves of bread and fish become available. Some of the other gospels explain that a little boy brought these five loaves and two fish and Jesus multiplied them. So Jesus, the bread of life, uses this bread to feed everyone and they were all satisfied. That's a dramatic statement. It didn't say they were all full. It said they were all satisfied. That's just too easy for us to pick up on as a, with a deeper meaning. It really is. But before they distribute this bread and fish, Jesus gives an interesting instruction to the disciples. Verses 39 and 40 say this. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in the grass in groups of hundreds and fifties. They sat in small groups. Now what's going on here? Why would Mark and some of the other gospel writers take the time to point out this particular organized seating in this story? I will tell you that I don't know the exact reason that Mark included this or points this out, but I do believe there's an important and an inspired reason for that detail. We know that the miracles of Jesus are to be celebrated and explained. We know that. Yet we try, we try to explain them to the very last detail, and I'm not sure we always can. However, there may be a lesson in the explanation for us. And one explanation often given for this miracle focuses on sharing instead of multiplication. The sharing in those smaller groups instead of the multiplication of five loaves and two fishes. William Barclay a commentator says that when people sat down in groups, they were moved to share their lunches or dinner with others. It was in the sharing that the miracle really happened. Believe as you like, but never underestimate the power of community among people. How often does your family sit down to a meal together? That's a hard question today, especially. And I don't ask that question to make anyone feel guilty, just to point out that a happy meal is more than a hamburger and a supersized fries at McDonald's. A happy meal is a community eating together. Is there something that happens in community that's way beyond the calories of the food? Of course there is. And I know it's a tough world out there. I live in it. There's soccer, there's church, there's schoolwork, there's job responsibilities, there's meetings, there's habits that all pull us in opposite directions all at the same time. When something must give, it's awfully easy for the family meal to be the first to go. I just want you to think about what is lost when there is no family meal. What are we missing? And for those of you who no longer have family around to eat with, this idea of community can be two people, or three people, or four people. The number is not what is important. Whenever you sit at table with one or more people, scripture tells us that he is there when one or more, two or more are gathered, right? But it creates a community, even if it's a community of two, which is always more enjoyable than dining alone. How many of us like to go out to eat all by ourselves? We do it, but we don't like that. We'd rather have somebody to talk to. Verse 43 tells us about the leftovers. The disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. There was more than enough for 5,000 people. Friends, there is always more than enough at God, with God, at the table with us. More than enough love, more than enough fellowship, more than enough food, 
more than enough spiritual growth. The COVID pandemic taught us a lot about food and hunger. It's not all about the calories or the need for those calories. That was pointed out to us dramatically. Food is meant to be shared. And how dramatic and emotional it was whenever we were all forced to share meals at home with family members. And likewise, for those who did not have family members at home, how emotional was it when we came out of the pandemic and we finally could eat with someone else? It was strong. God has provided for us and will continue to provide for us. In this season of Lent, as we reflect on our own weakness so we can repent, let's be reminded of the importance of meeting Jesus at the table, any table. Whether it's the dining room table at home with family, the table in a favorite restaurant with a friend, or the Lord's table right here in worship during communion, Jesus is there. And he will provide more than enough during that time. During Lent, the theme of giving up or going without either food or something else is a reminder to focus on God with us. And it's a constant theme behind all of these feeding of the multitudes in the Gospels. And for us during Lent, we are in a wilderness or place of scarcity in a lot of ways where nothing can be taken for granted. And in our time of need, though, God provides us with his bread every time. And it's not about whatever we are eating, what the bread is, but who is providing more than enough. It's all about who's providing it. The bread of life provided by God includes his word, which is the deep nourishment we all need during this season and beyond. And with all this discussion about food, I'm getting a little hungry, but I also want to say I'm not trying to hurt anyone's self-esteem by any of these statements. Here is what I am trying to say. With God, there's more than enough. More than enough love, more than enough food, more than enough grace, more than enough life, more than enough meaning to see you and I throughout our journey. Because even the crumbs under the table are enough. Let me close with these words from the psalmist. Mary talked about the Psalms. The psalmist says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He satisfies the hungry heart with the gifts of finest wheat. Come give to us, O saving Lord, the bread of life to eat. Amen. In our time of prayer, as we do each week, we want to offer up all those people, places, circumstances on our hearts and minds, knowing that God will answer us in his way and in his time. So what are the joys and concerns? I would lift up, before, before that, I would lift up the 30-hour famine. Um, Crystal and Aaron and Karen and Michelle and Matt and I all experienced, and Jill, Rhoda, all experienced, along with all the kids, what hunger means today and what the needs are, but more importantly, what we can do about it. And so I'm thankful that uh, we're able to participate in that event each year. And I'm thankful for all of the kids, youth, and adults that, that participate and give of their time and effort to that. Rosie. Do you like to go by Rosie or Rose? Just Rose is fine. Okay. Okay, Rose. so the girl who was in the accident, Paige, she has been 
coming to school for lunch to visit her friends. She's making a really good like recovery. That's and nice. And people are coming to visit her, and there's a lot of like good news that we've heard about her. So I just want to thank the Lord for that. That's a joy. Thank God. That's an answer to lots of prayers. And the whole fellowship of food. What happened at the school? Just saying, lunches. Um, I want to lift up Tammy Mayhe. Um, she's been sick all week, and um, I didn't even realize she was sick, so just wanted to put her in everyone's prayers. Thank you. Anna Mary. I think it's a joy that the Mars UP Church is having the Lenten luncheons again. It's every Friday at noon, and the different pastors in the area are taking turns giving a little message each week. So three of us went last Friday, and we enjoyed it. So I think I'm not out of line inviting all of you to go to the Mars UP Church on Friday for lunch. That schedule is going to be emailed out this week. Um, Brian just got me the schedule, so it was too late to go out this, this past week, but it'll go out this week. I'd like prayers for Corey's discernment um, in her decision to where she's going to um, attend college. She has to decide by March 1st, which is approaching quickly. And so just prayers for her discernment and where she feels being led by God to, to be in this next part of her journey. And also, thank you for continued prayers for her concussion as she c continues to still work through that recovery as well. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> Grove City. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Gloria. <laughs> Um, I wanted to update you all and thank you so much for praying for my friend Janelle. She did get a bunch of her tests back and although she does have a type of cancer that I can't think of or say, it's very treatable and a lot of her other tests were negative. So when they were first originally thinking maybe it had spread to all these other areas where she was having trouble, it did not. So thank you so very much. And another thing, if you would please um, lift up Zach in prayer. He has uh, test number six on March 6th, so just prayers for that. He's working real hard towards that. And just for healing, he did fall and sprain his ankle. And he has a little trip planned soon and just wants to make sure that he is healed and will still be able to go. Thank you. Gloria. Um, I just wanted to say um, I have some joys. Um, Dave is finally home from the hospital. My boyfriend, Dave Davidson. Um, it's been a long journey for him. He's now staying with his mother. and He still has a long road ahead of him to get healthy and strong, but he's out of the hospital and on the road to recovery and getting better. Um, I've been struggling with my illness again and relapsed back in May and um, been having to deal with that through all this with Dave and then I thought my <laughs> plate was pretty full and my mother got real bad um, and so I've been dealing with that too but thank the Lord there um, she's getting proper care she's in the hospital for a week with a, a blocked artery in the back of her leg, which caused severe swelling of both feet. And, and still the right leg is real bad. That was the, where the occlusion is. But to the, um, my beautiful sister who's a nurse and my two girls and that have been working with me and steadily with taking care of her around the clock, she's doing much, much better. And as I said, I'm doing much, much better and Finally, um, things are turning around for me, too. So it's been a rough three months, but I always know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and I'm starting to see it. <laughs> and you know who that light is. Yes, indeed. Aaron. 
So we would like prayers for Jason. Um, he's getting ready to transition into his last semester of schooling, um, and then he'll be graduating in May. Um, but we have found him an apartment to help him commute a little easier. So this coming week, he will be moving out. So as we uh, transition into another phase of life, um, just prayers for him and the, the blessing that is, um, but also the, the stressor that that is. I'll share one joy, too. We were at um, uh, Mars New Year's this past year. It was a celebration in Mars, PA, for all the things that are happening STEAM-related. And our very own Mary was recognized. I didn't realize, but she was the 2021 Martian of the year. Um, and they didn't get a chance to recognize her because of COVID, and they recognized her that night. And that's all the things Mary has been doing with children around STEAM education, which was really cool. So way to go, Mary. Doris. I would just like to have a little prayer for Nancy. She's not feeling well. We think she has a virus, and we're hoping that's all it is. Thank you. Let's take all of our prayers to God. God of this season, God of our lives, God our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Lord God, you have heard lots of prayer comments, requests, and prayer communication today. We know that in the joys and concerns, you are there, and that you take care of us, and you provide for us, but you also challenge us, you also lead us, you also help us to grow. And may all of these people and circumstances cause us to grow closer to you and cause them to grow closer to you. Lord God, you have heard all of the joys and concerns and we trust that you know the needs personally for each person as your people. Your love is eternal and never changes, never ends, is always there for us. So provide for all of them. Lend your healing hand, give your strength, provide your peace. Draw them closer and us closer to each other and to you. Lord God, the, um, the prayer requests seem to be full of transitions and change and health and the joys of recovery. You are a blessing in all of those emotions and all of those situations. So we trust that you will continue to walk with us and all of these people so that all would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Dear God, in this season of Lent, turn our hearts to you Open them up honestly to you. Help us to sense the God-sized hole in our hearts that only you can fill. And help us to admit our weaknesses that only you can solve and resolve. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, uh, especially in this season, as he meets us at the table, at the tables where we are, where we find ourselves. Strengthen us through those table experiences. Enlighten us through your word and the time spent with friends, family, loved ones, and your people. Help us to remain strong in this season so that we might see light at the end of the tunnel, which is Resurrection Day and that we might tell others about this good news of your gospel. We ask and we pray all of these things today and every day in the strong name of Jesus, your son, who taught us when we pray to say these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is easy for us to recognize the generosity of our God in giving us his only son. 
As one form of gratitude, though, we offer back to God a portion of what he has blessed us with in our daily lives. So join with me in this prayer of dedication of our giving and our gifts. Lord God of our lives, we bring you our gifts this day and every day. And as we give of our time, our talents, our resources, our very selves, bless all of these gifts. Multiply all of these gifts. Spread all of these gifts for your use through your hands and feet in this world so that all would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that is your purpose, and that is your will. And we pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Please stand if you're able and join me in singing our closing hymn, Lord Be Glorified. God has placed you there for a purpose, and Jesus Christ living inside of you will walk with you, strengthen you, and prepare you for that purpose. So go with the love of God, the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the fellowship, guidance, and strength of the Holy Spirit today and every day. Amen. <laughs>